was Snap Boogie always stole the money? Why'd you let him play? Got to. This America, man. Today, June 2nd, is the 20th anniversary of The Wire. Two decades later, and we're still talking about it. That means several people did several things right. What's up, everybody? And welcome to The Wire at 20 podcast from HBO and Campside Media. I'm your host, Method Man. You might remember me as Melvin Cheese Wagstaff from seasons two through five. And I'll be your guide through the next eight episodes of this podcast as we look back at an unforgettable show that raised the bar for television. Through interviews with the cast, crew, and creators, we'll walk you through the show's origin story, casting, and production. We'll also be revisiting our favorite moments and sharing tons of stories from behind the scenes of the show. Now, you all know I played Cheese, who was part of Prop Joe's crew, right? What, you mean to tell me there's a West Side nigga that know how to sell shit without sticking a pistol in a fiend's face? Uh, yeah, dog. But what you might not know is that The Wire was one of my first times being on a TV show. Facts. I already worked with Alexa Fogel, the casting director on the TV show Oz. But when she was casting for The Wire, I came in to read for the part of Cheese, and you know, she was very gracious. I was green at the time. I remember seeing Mr. Cheeks on my way out. I thought, damn, I'm not gonna get this part. But somehow I got it. I guess the rest is history. Now, it took a lot to get The Wire on TV. And the creators? Well, they had to be strategic and do some begging to make it happen. But let me start at the beginning. Is this just for audio? Good. Otherwise, I'd put on a better shirt. <laughs> now, see, that was David Simon, the creator of The Wire. He's a great guy, brilliant guy. He's made several TV shows since then, and I was in one of them. <coughs> the deuce. But before all of that, he was a journalist at the Baltimore Sun. I had no intention uh, of writing for television. I had no um, interest in it until it happened. It's very, it's a very strange thing. I came up as a journalism major at the University of Maryland. I was a stringer, so I sort of covered the campus and the Maryland suburbs for the Baltimore Sun for about a year. They actually offered me a temporary job. They said, we're probably not going to keep you past six months, but you'll get some clips. You'll get some experience. This goes back to like 1980. I was like 22 years old. And, uh, they hired me, so I was very young at a large paper. They put me on the night police beat, which was 4 to 12. And I worked every weekend for two years. That was the beginning of me um, starting to understand my city in terms of its crime culture, in terms of racial politics, class politics. You can see the fault lines of the city. In 1984, David met someone who would become an important figure in his life and work, Ed Burns. Hi, I'm Ed Burns. As far as police work goes, I was sort of Jimmy McNulty, to a point. Ed was a cop in Baltimore at the time. And when David was covering the homicide unit for the Baltimore Sun, Ed was David's best informant. I'll let Ed tell you a little more about his background. When I came home from Vietnam, I became a cop. I was working in a, what they call the Western District, called it the Wild West. It was a district of about 33,000 people. The poverty was astonishing. And um, the courage of the people that I, I met sort of inspired me to, to want to know more about that world. Since I was not from, you know, I was a white city kid. And this was a black world. Many of the cops that I work with were um, either totally disinterested in what was going on or just downright racist. So I sort of cut a little path for myself, started meeting people on the street, helping out guys who had small charges, and learning the whole sort of the economic structure that, that was the driving force in cities like Baltimore, the drug world. The average that is recommended for a detective uh, working homicide is two cases a year. In Baltimore, 
When I was in homicide, you would get two cases a week. <laughs> so I gathered up about 14 case folders, just like in the wire, and, and brought it into the captain and said to him, um, you know, we're going about it the wrong way. He wasn't interested in that. So I went over to the state's attorney's office and with his muscle, I uh, was relieved from homicide to work on these cases. And in about 18 months later, we brought down a major drug organization and solved most of the cases that I worked on. Homicide was resentful that I wasn't like working on the homicides. And narcotics was resentful because I was a homicide detective doing more than they were doing. The only thing that saved my ass was I had the backing of the state's attorney's office. I remember meeting David, I was in the DEA office, and I don't know how he got past security, <laughs> but he came walking into the squad where I was, and he introduced himself, and he said he had permission from the police department to work on the case I was working on, and he was loved to see, you know, the wire. And I said to him, you know, I I'm gonna show it to you, and you can listen, and then I'm going to lock you up, and um, you'll get charged with intervening in an investigation. And the penalty, I think, is like 10 years. So you want to do that? And he said no. <laughs> I guess the rest is, is history. Davis' reporting on the Baltimore Homicide Unit led to his first book, Homicide, A Year on the Killing Streets which was released in 1991. After Ed left the police force, David and Ed began work on its follow-up, a book called The Corner, A Year in the Life of an Inner City Neighborhood, which was published in 1997. The book examined how addiction impacted the lives of people who lived at the intersection of Fayette and Monroe, an open-air drug market in West Baltimore. Meanwhile, NBC adapted Homicide into a TV show, Simon declined an offer to write the pilot, but he did write an episode for the show's second season. A couple of years later, David took a buyout from the Baltimore Sun and joined Homicide staff full-time. It was there he developed a relationship with the showrunner, Tom Fontana. I, I went to work for Homicide because my newspaper was offering me a year's salary to leave. And so I had a chance to have a year's salary for free and learn this new skill set from Tom Fontana and Barry Levinson on homicide. And then Tom Fontana came out with a show on HBO called Oz. And it was a very dark drama about life in a, in a prison, in a penitentiary, that I was shocked to see on TV. You got to remember, at this time, HBO was not producing original drama. This was one of the first uh, forays into that milieu. And so I'm watching this. I'm watching, looking at his pilot. I'm thinking, they're going to put this on TV? Damn. Watching Oz inspired David. He wondered if HBO would ever adapt the corner for television. And to his surprise, they did. I'm fucking tired of New York niggas taking money for shit that don't even get folks out the gate. You a lying bitch. Your ass it eventually won an Emmy for Outstanding Miniseries in 2000. So we did the corner, and it did well. And the HBO guys came up to me and said, well, what else you got? And a lot of what we wrote about in the corner, the systemic problems with the war on drugs, the, the policy issues, the failure of policy, really. We couldn't pull that to the keyhole of the miniseries because, you know, nobody's talking about that stuff at the corner of Monroe and Fayette. Your characters really aren't delving into it very much. So I just thought, well, what if we, uh, Ed Burns and myself, what if we could explore what's gone wrong politically, in, in, you know, with the war on drugs and, and with the idea of a, of a city that can no longer even recognize its own problems, much less solve any of it. So that became The Wire. HBO was intrigued by The Wire, but they still weren't completely sold. So David, being David, had to write what he called uh, begging-ass memos to push the network over the edge. We actually sold what The Wire was to, to HBO in stages. The first stage was, I wrote a memo, and I said, look, you guys have counter-programmed network TV beautifully, which is to say, those things that the, the networks can't go near, you know, a mob family with the head of the mob family in psychoanalysis. I don't know. 
stress maybe uh, or hypersexed women in new york who speak bluntly i write a column called sex and city you you guys know what you're doing when it comes to putting out there what networks can't do but what if the next stage for you is to do what the networks have made their bread and butter which is top some robbers but do it in such a way so that you make uh, anachronistic the notion of are they going to catch the bad guys what if we just did what the networks claim to do well and we did it better and we did it in such a way so that it undercut the premise of the network cop show. If you do that, you will have stolen one from the networks in a really subversive way. And that memo landed pretty well. In addition to that memo, Ed Burns, who was working closely with David, took the lead on writing a 79 page story Bible for The Wire's first season. Nowadays, it's pretty famous. It's all over the internet with people poring over it for tidbits and details. Here's one. Did you know that when they were first writing the show, the character of Stringer Bell was called Stringy? <laughs> I doubt he would have gotten the same respect if that stuck. 40? Nobody give a fuck about 40. Nobody remember 40? And y'all niggas is giving me way too many 40 degree days. What the fuck? Now, you're going to hear from two more people who were crucial to the show's origin story and what The Wire became moving forward. Nina Noble, an executive producer who saved our asses on numerous occasions, especially mine. And George Pelicanos, a writer and eventual producer. That guy could write the hell out of a scene. Here's Nina and George. I'm Nina Noble. My credit was probably producer during the pilot, and then at the end I was executive producer had many titles. This is George Pelicanus. I, uh, I was on The Wire for all five seasons. Um, uh, started out as a writer and then story editor and producer. My first thought about what this show was going to be was sort of not the cop show that you see on network TV. I mean, that's the way David pitched it. His question to them was, why should HBO do a cop show? And the answer that he provided was that we're going to do it right. I, I saw right away that it was different than anything that had ever been, any certainly any kind of cop show that had ever been made. The cops are going to be three-dimensional. The victims and the citizens are going to be three-dimensional. And it's going to be about a larger you know story about operations and, and systems, which create a system of policing that doesn't work. Cop shows in general are usually about the law side winning, okay? What they're telling the viewers in, in essence is that if you break the law, you're going to get caught. You're going to pay a price. There's a murder in the first act, and in the last act, it's going to get solved. The world will be set upright again. We never did that, and people weren't used to it. I think at the time that, that HBO bought The Wire, we were fulfilling a particular niche. HBO was a network with, with pretty much white shows. And so I think there was some concern about that. And so I think we were helping with their uh, diversity at the time. I'm not sure too many of the executives at that time knew what the show was really about. They, <laughs> they were just like, yeah, okay, you guys are in Baltimore. It's a relatively inexpensive show. You know, just go do it. It's fine. I think actually the first season, they didn't understand what a lot of the characters were saying. They didn't really understand <laughs> a lot that was going on, but it was okay. You know, it's like, okay, you know, just do it. No, motherfucker. It ain't just up to stank them to be muscle. You got to pick. Your people supposed to be ready for the Rio. You supposed to be steady for him. But where are you at? You in a goddamn salmon shop. You got $20,000 D coming into your shop and you ain't even around to see that shit right. I got my beat sheet and it was pretty confusing because it's really difficult to write a script when you're not there in the room every day, hearing everything and getting the feedback that you need and the information that you need. So I asked David to come over to my house and we sat out back on my porch and he sort of went over all the beats with me. And then I went to Europe for a book tour. And I remember being in Paris one night in my hotel room, looking down the street I was having a cocktail and I was looking down there and I was getting, I, was, I had a little anxiety because I knew I had to come back and write this script in two weeks. I took his notes. I did rewrites. 
I gave it to David, and then I get the finished script back. And I called David up and I said, what happened to my script? <laughs> because it didn't really resemble uh, what I had written. And he had me on speakerphone. He was on the, in the room with Jim Yashimura, uh, a very you know accomplished screenwriter who he had worked with on Homicide. And, and David says, uh, well, you got, you got 35% of what you wrote in there. And he says to Jim, Jim, tell him, tell him what that means. And, and Jim says, well, that's, that's pretty good for a first-time television writer. David loved George's script so much that he offered him a core role in the writer's room. George even shared an office with Ed, which meant that George got a front-row seat to David and Ed's creative partnership and blowout arguments. Because here's the thing about David and Ed. Both of them like to be right. Ed and David together are a very interesting team who sort of thrive on conflict and confrontation. Sometimes you would come up and enter their office where the you know assistants were and there'd be like a closed door and you'd just hear all this yelling. It was a very um, argumentative room. Sometimes it was people standing up, putting their fingers in another guy's chest or screaming at the other guy. It got to be just business as usual. George Pelicanos, who's a lot more of a quiet sort of person. George would try to be working, you know. He'd try to just be working and doing his thing and there'd just be a lot of commotion. This was dialed up, man. You know what I mean? It was like really dialed up. Well, I shared an office with Ed and we got along well. But in that room, you know, he was, Ed was the aggressor. He was quick to anger. And David's very good with, with words. So there was that old saying, um, which came up many times, I would agree with you, but then we'd both be wrong. And I think it took a while to realize that that's, you know, that's the nature of their relationship and that's sort of how they thrive. You know, if you come into that and you just hear people constantly yelling at each other, you may think that maybe, maybe it's not a good partnership or maybe they don't respect each other or don't understand each other, but actually none of those things are true. Now that I'm a showrunner and I put together rooms myself, I, I like to have different viewpoints and you don't want yes men or yes women because that doesn't get you anything either. But I was sort of a peacemaker in that room. And sometimes I remember one week, we really did spend a whole week arguing about one thing, which was the SIM cards in the phone. There's no phone extension in the place. Just these cell phone chips, about a hundred of them. I think it was me who finally said, look, we have to move on. We've got to get back to work because all we're doing now is arguing. It was a bunch of guys that were prideful and pretty thick skinned to the, to the degree that more sensitive people would have, would have walked out of there in tears or something or, or just not come back. Lahane and Price, I respect those guys to the nth degree. They're some of the best novelists we have. Having said that, I wanted to kick their ass. I mean, I wanted to write the best script every season. And I think they felt the same way. That sense of competition kind of lifted all the boats. Nobody was sloughing off, you know what I mean? Everybody was trying to do the best work they could out of pride. And I remember there was a lot of tension in that room, and probably more tension than in any room I've been in since. It could get annoying at times, but the result was we made a good show, and it was because of the argument. I credit David with making me better at arguing. You really have to prepare your argument, you have to know all your facts, and you have to not be shy about presenting them if you really feel strongly about something. We also asked David and Ed about those writer's room debates. And David had a pretty good explanation. I mean, the dynamic with Ed, and he'll, he, I don't know if we'll admit it or not, but Ed comes into the writer's room, he has 20 good ideas thematically for what we should do. And I'm the guy who was trained as a writer. Ed was trained as an idea guy. Um, and right away, I can see that, like, we have room for six or seven of these. And after a while, it's going to be too much fat on the skeleton. But Whereas a genuinely healthy individual, 
would be like, wow, they're doing four or five or six of my main themes and we're, we're getting to it. And we're, Ed literally looks at the 13 you left on the floor and says, I am betrayed. <laughs> Here's what Ed had to say. The writer's room has a give and take to it. It doesn't work if you just sit there. It doesn't work if you're not thinking about story. If we're going in the wrong direction, somebody will back us up. So it, it, it's, there's tension in it. Eventually, all those ideas coalesced, and they crafted something truly impressive, no matter how much tension was in the room. We're good at this, Lester. In this town, we're as good as it gets. Natural police. Fuck yes, natural police. Now, we all know The Wire can be a little hard to digest at first. I mean, it's a huge ensemble. You're like, well, who are all these people? Why does this matter? There are so many names and so many storylines to follow. But you know what? That's part of the show's brilliance. It takes a little work, but the payoff is so worth it. Here are Ed Burns and Nina Noble again. David did have a very keen idea, I thought. He says there's two types of audiences. The ones that sit up and the ones that lay back. And we'll write for the ones that sit up and pay attention. I admire that David doesn't feel the need to explain everything. And there were people at HBO that suggested maybe we should have chirons, maybe we should have subtitles, you know, for some of this stuff because people won't understand it. And he always resisted that. And I think what happened was as people acquired the show, as they watched the show more and more, they got to understand the language. And then that became sort of a secret code, in a sense, of the people that watch the show. And the, the wire audience started to bond around this secret language. It's simple, it's simple. See this? This the kingpin, all right? And he the man. You get the other dude's king, you got the game. And he trying to get your king too, so you got protected. Now the king, he moved one space any direction he damn choose, cause he's the king. Like this, 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 all right? But he ain't got no hustle. But the rest of these motherfuckers on the team, they got his back. And they run so deep, he really ain't gotta do shit. I like your uncle. Yeah, like my uncle. It's kind of funny that a show as cynical as The Wire would trust his audience to follow the thread, pick up on all the nuance, and submit to the journey. The Wire was ambitious, and his creators understood that they had an opportunity to really say something with their chests. The last thing the TV landscape needed was another drama about hero cops chasing one-note villains, which reinforced ideas about who society considered good and bad. Nah. The Wire saw the world for what it was, good and bad, especially the bad. It pulled things apart to show people how things you commit to will betray you in the end. It showed the collateral damage of a bullshit war on drugs. Some people may not have wanted to hear it, but everyone needed to. Ed Burns. We have a very, very small pipeline of mainstream information. And at that particular time, it was either black men in handcuffs or black men bleeding out on a corner. You know, murder this, murder that. No systemicness to it. No understanding of why these were was happening. No understanding of what compressed to make this world. We don't need the people who can work with their backs, so we forget about them. And the way we forget about them is the war on drugs, which, of course, is not a war on drugs at all. It's a war on people. You see, it came to me that what I was witnessing was a holocaust in slow motion that burned through the urban black community, the poor white community, and then with cocaine, burned even greater, destroying generation after generation of kids. And it's going on right now. Coming up on The Wire at 20. The guy running for mayor at Baltimore at the time actually held the book up at the corner of Monroe and Fayette while he was running for mayor and said, you know, Marty, did you read the book? And he said, no, but I know what it says. Baltimore got a bad rap because it was filmed there. But the drugs are everywhere. I don't think it's good for tourism. Once the show got picked up, we said, you know what? Why don't we just get like a two-bedroom apartment? 
and it became like a somewhat of a fraternity house, one of many. I made a list and then I just cut out all the things that I do. I cut out sugar, I cut out turning on the TV, I cut out having sex, and yes, I'd be walking around the apartment fucking fiending. <laughs> I'd call it Bobby Go Bob. You know, by this time last year, they picked up season two. <laughs> they haven't picked up season three yet. I can't get my head around that the kids who played the students in my classroom are now pushing 30 years old. It kind of doesn't make sense. You can only hope for something like this where it becomes classic, truly classic. If you liked what you heard, you know what to do. Subscribe. And whether you're a diehard fan or this is the show you've always been meaning to watch, head to HBO Max to stream all five seasons of The Wire now. It's also on Blu-ray and DVD, yo. So watch it wherever. Just watch The Wire, man. The Wire at 20 podcast is a production of HBO and Campside Media. This episode was produced by Cliff Method Man Smith, Natalia Winkleman, and Shauna Gar. Julian Kimball is our story editor, our associate producer is Lily Houston Smith. No relation. At Campside Media, our executive producer is Josh Dean. Editing and sound design by Rod Sherwood and David Devereaux. Thanks for listening and see you next time.